Hello, hello and welcome. My name is Sandra Jackson Opoku. I'm one of the three black women writers that make up the Indignant Women Collective. And I'm so pleased to be in conversation um, this evening with two amazing women in their own right. Um, there is the award-winning poet, novelist, and playwright, and nonfiction writer, Angela Jackson, who, among many other published works, is the author of A Surprised Queenhood and the New Black Sun, The Life and Legacy of Gwendolyn Brooks. I'm equally honored to be here with Imani Perry, Dr. Imani Perry, if you please, um, the celebrated professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and author of many works, among them Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to, well, you two are exceptional writers in your own right in, in today's literary landscape. Um, and you're also women who've pinned biographies onto exceptional black women writers. Um, Gwendolyn Brooks, who was the U.S. and Illinois Poet Laureate and the first black to win a Pulitzer in literature, and of course, writer and activist and playwright Lorraine Hansberry, the first black woman to have a play on Broadway. I wonder for both of you, did you encounter any particular uh, challenges, surprises, or revelations um, in your research and in your writing on these two phenomenal women writers? Angela? I, well, first of all, Gwendolyn Brooks was the first per black person to win a Pulitzer of any kind. So she was uh, a, a trailblazer. She was always a trailblazer in her activities with her group. When she finished uh, Wilson Jr., she joined the NAACP Youth Council along with Margaret Burroughs and John H. Johnson and another uh, of other serious-minded young black people. These people were committed and serious activists and intellectuals who one of their um, protests was to put paper lynch ropes around their necks and march around the building in protest of the lynchings down south. So she was an activist at an early age, and she was always attracted to that activism in young people. And I think that's what drew her to the poets and activists of the 60s, wherein she became reborn. And, but she had always been conscious, but people, and people don't give her credit for her consciousness. Imani, any challenges, revelations in yeah. your researching and writing on the life of Lorraine Hansberry? Yeah, I mean, I, um, one of the challenges was that it had been many years since there had been a book to, that covered her life. And at the same time, I knew there were other people writing about her life. So I had to figure out what I had to offer to tell her story that was distinctive, but also be very deliberate about leaving space for these other extraordinary women who were writing about her as well. Um, and in terms of surprises, I mean, I think very similar to Gwendolyn Brooks, one of the things I write about is that even though Lorraine didn't talk about it explicitly, it was very clear she was directly influenced by Gwendolyn Brooks, both um, politically and artistically. Um, but one of, the, and I think she sort of recognized as someone who had been uh, an activist, but less so as an intellectual. And in some sense, that was a surprise to see 
how um, intensely she read to read the margin comments and the in the like various works of theory and scholarship that she was um, that she was um, in digesting that she was that she kept all the when she studied with Du Bois she kept all the notes from her classes with him I mean that so that she you know the the intellectual and artist and activist parts were always all of a piece um, and I and so. And less a surprise, but much more, I guess, that I once I realized how substantial that was, it was really important to me to highlight that as well, because I think that was a part of her story that had been um, made absent. I mean, she was this hugely uh, um, important figure in American theater, and she was sort of invisible in many ways. So, so um, with Gwendolyn Brooks, she she lived up to the dawn of the. 21st century, mm -hmm. and you actually knew her very well. So did you. Yeah. And I did too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you the one that wrote the biography. <laughs> so I just wonder how this intimate, you know, sort of personal knowledge of this uh, writer who we maybe irreverently called Gwen. I so, never called her Gwen. Uh, <laughs> I, I called her Gwen. I called her, I called her Miss Brooks or Nora's mama. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, but at any rate, have, knowing someone and then embarking on this very serious and deliberate uh, look at their life, uh, how did that, you know, perhaps help you and did it in any ways maybe censor you? Oh, that's a good question. To begin with, uh, Rakia Clark from Beacon approached me about doing the, the biography, and I wouldn't even think about it until I had checked with Miss Brooks' daughter, Nora, and Nora's response was that I was one of the few people that um, her mother would have wanted to do her biography, so that made me feel more comfortable in doing it. Though, I must say did it make it easier? In a certain sense, it made it easier, but in another sense, I was determined not to savage her life. You know, you, how, how uh, people deliberately misconstrue stuff in order to suggest things that aren't there or, you know, or present a person in a, a negative light. My aim, because I was asked to do it in celebration of her 100th year anniversary, I wanted to celebrate her in her life and to really get a sense of her achievement and her greatness as a poet and a person and a, a woman in touch with her, with her moment in, in time and, and history and in love with her people. Yes, so the surprised queenhood and a new black son. I mean, that's an awesome title. She, that's from her. Yeah, yeah. those are her words. So, <laughs> so how did how did you how did you did you pick your favorite um, excerpt from a Gwendolyn Brooks poem? Or I mean, how did you that's come up from with that her title? autobiography, where she that, that uh, report from Part One published in 1972, where she says uh, she had gone the gamut from experiencing um, the, the self-hatred of her peers being projected onto her and her dark uh, brown skin, her blackness, and she had run the gamut of now being accepted and embraced in this surprise queenhood in the new black sun for the totality of her being, her, her achievements, and her exterior. Okay. So now on the other hand, Imani, 
Lorraine Hansberry died so tragically young. Yes. And uh, maybe, what, eight years before you were even born? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so wh what kind of challenges did that present in, in discovering this radiant life of this woman who was no longer with us? Yeah, I mean, you know, I didn't, um, I will say I didn't, find the time gap a challenge in part because she kept such extraordinarily beautiful records of her life, really intimate records. Um, and I identified deeply with her in part because, you know, when I went through her library, I said, oh, I have that book and I have that book and I have that book and there this, you know, kinds of questions and concerns that she was, um, uh, that she was, fixated on were, were similar to mine. I think the thing that was the challenge is I wanted to do her justice. You know, she was so extraordinary and it had been so long. I mean, there's this beautiful documentary, um, Sighted Eyes, Feeling Heart, that if you haven't seen, I recommend it by Tracy Strain. And thank goodness that was out. So that took a little of the pressure off because I was like, well, even if my book isn't good, the documentary's out there. But but I wanted, you know, to 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 get a likeness of her, um, and I think similarly this question, you know, she she struggled with her illness um, emotionally. She had experienced depression, and I didn't want to be too intrusive. Um, and then she she didn't struggle with her sexuality, but she wasn't out. She identified as a lesbian, but she wasn't out. And I, um, I so I, I was making decisions about what was very clearly kept as a record that she intended to have out in the world. And then there were certain things that were too private, made a decision, I'm not going to sort of get all into the intimate details of her relationship when they weren't letters that she had preserved, but they were other, other, in other people's possession. You know, so those kinds of um, questions were, um, were a challenge. And then I'd say one more thing, just in, because I'm, in, I'm here in Chicago, and that is one of my sort of fixations in African-American studies is a little bit of decentering New York and centering Chicago as the center of sort of 20th century black cultural production. And so it was also, even though she's someone who left Chicago to, for New York, I wanted to make sure that I was able to render what she clearly understood as the significance of the city of Chicago. Yeah, so. So this is a kind of a personal thing that I've always wondered, particularly after I saw the documentary and read mm -hmm. your novel. And that was that the you know, totality, the seriousness, the seriousness of her illness yeah. was kept from her, yes. which seems to be so shocking it's... in today's you know, culture that mm -hmm. a, a person could have a terminal illness and not be told. How do you sort of explain and wrap your mind around the fact that other people were aware and she was. Yeah. It's devastating. I mean, and it, you know, it was the standard of care. It was practice. The thought was if people knew that they were about to die, then they wouldn't fight. And then, they, you know, so, but it was clear, you know, she was in excruciating pain. Towards the end of her life, she had periods of, um, of blindness, of, um, of, um, I forget the term, and I'm, not, I'm blanking on it because I had it, but the illness that covers your, your, your skin. I mean, she had a lot of physical pain, so she knew she was seriously ill, but didn't know what was happening, and I think that was profoundly disorienting and frustrating, particularly because she was still trying to finish work. So um, her uncle, um, the historian, um, William Leo Hansberry, talked about he, when he came to see her in the hospital, you know, she sat up and wanted to know about everything he was studying. He was like the father of African studies and a professor at Howard. And she's, what are you studying and what are you learning? And he was like, you know, she's, she's about to die and she's still thinking so intensely. Yeah. Mm. So these writers, both writers, came of age in a period roughly between the, uh, the two world wars, the Great Depression and the Civil Rights Movement as sort of bookmarks. And uh, literary scholar Lawrence Jackson uh, describes this as the indignant generation, which is a kind of surprising, you know, kind of way of, because we, when we think about the indignation of the, 
uh, political struggle. We think of the civil rights movement and even more so the black power movement. So what was it about this time, and this question is for both of you, uh, uh, Gwen Gwendolyn, Miss Brooks, <laughs> was um, 13 years older than Lorraine Hansberry, so they had slightly different historical uh, experiences. But what is it about this time that, uh, that was important to their coming of age, both as writers, uh, as women, and as activists, literary activists? Uh, in 1948, the restrictive covenants were, were, were broken down and a new spirit of uh, pushing out was taking place with, with black people. Black people were moving into territories that we had not before and Ms. Brooks captured that in um, the ballad of Rudolph Reed. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, there was this whole issue of being uh, confined to certain spaces, like kitchenette, in kitchenette buildings. And uh, in Maud Martha, she deals with the whole issue of being confined. Um, and that whole sense of confinement and then pushing out in Rudolph Reed, and then and the pushing out increases in her 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 work that took place in the 1950s that led to the 1960 publication of the Bean Eaters, which deals with uh, not just race but also economic, mm -hmm. you know, injustice. Um, so all of that is, is a sense of simmering and pushing out going on in, at least in Miss Brooks' work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, our, we have an audience of mature people, but there's some young people in the audience as well. And I just wondered if you would explain restrictive covenants, because for some people this is a alien concept. Okay, this is where Black people were only allowed to buy property in certain areas and not in other areas of a city. For example, we could not buy property uh, past uh, uh, Cottage Grove or over, you know, over toward the, the lake. So that would be uh, off limits for us. We were confined to a space called the Black Belt. And you hear, you learn about the Black Belt in, in um, also in Native Son, Richard Wright's novel, and the results of being con uh, compressed into uh, a certain space. Um, one of the things that Ms. Brooks said that was so interesting in this film strip on her, she said that poverty, dealing with poverty inspired her. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in a poem like the poem that she's most well known for, We Real Cool, mm -hmm. wherein she takes like a snapshot of young uh, black men and in that snapshot, she creates a story that is as telling as the 400 pages of Richard Wright's Native Son. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, I had never thought of it that way, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. and, and she did have feelings about that poem uh, as, the years, yeah. <laughs> as the years went by. So, uh, Imani, how about with Lorraine Hansberry, how did this indignant generation inform her coming of age literarily and also politically? Yeah, I mean, so, um, just a, an important detail of her life is that her father, um, Carl Hansberry, was known as the Kitchenette King and the Defender. Um, and he was sort of a real estate mogul um, and by some accounts, people would refer to him as a slumlord. Um, and I say that because her best, her childhood best friend told me that it was okay for me to say that. Um, 
Um, and so, and Lorraine, but he also was really invested in, in breaking restrictive covenants. So in 1940, a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, Hansberry v. Lee, was actually a case where he litigated um, moving into a neighborhood that was covered by a r racially restrictive covenant. They won. Covenants were, the restrictive covenants were not struck down, but he won because the private agreement that kept black people out hadn't been executed properly. And so Lorraine was seven um, and you know, dealt with, there was a, a rock thrown through the window, narrowly missed her face, she almost, she could have died. Um, she was spat on, she was uh, harassed, abused. You know, there were protesters outside their house. And her position after all of that was, okay, well he won the case but Chicago is still as segregated as it ever was. And she moved politically much further to the left than her father. It's also the fact that her father, at, at, towards the end of his life, got so frustrated. He was very traditional, like wanted to do civil rights a conventional way, um, was a capitalist, all of these things. And he just got so frustrated with the resistance of the country to any movement towards racial justice that he said, forget it, and I'm taking my family to Mexico. And he bought a house there and had a brain aneurysm while there and died. And that's the reason. So the combination of, I think, her father becoming embittered despite doing everything the quote unquote right way um, and the encounter with the depth of racism in, in, in the city of Chicago actually pushed her further left. Um, she became a young progressive when she was at the University of was. Uh, Wisconsin at Madison, um, and she was a member of the debate club when she was at Inglewood. So I think the sort of the post-war generation, we oftentimes don't talk about it, but high school students were very politically engaged um, and really sort of thinking a lot about ideas and politics, and that kind of carried her through um, her young adulthood. And then she's also mentored by an older generation of organizers, Paul Robeson, W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, um, and she becomes very close with James Baldwin and, and sort of politically mentors Nina Simone. So she's sort of in between these two generations. Um, but I will say that, you know, Lorraine is very much an internationalist politically in many ways. Like she was thinking, she, you know, she identified as a socialist. She was thinking about global issues. But when the Southern movement happened, she got excited in a way that was very, was different. It was transformative for her. Um, and she, as she was dying, she kept saying, I, I wish I could get better so that I could see what kind of revolutionary I would actually be by going down south. So she's sort of in between generations. She's like a bridge figure, I think. Um, and so didn't have the opportunity um, you know, that Miss Brooks had in terms of actually sort of living through, through the freedom movement fully. Um, but she, she certainly um, did quite a bit to, to, to participate. As she could. Angela, is there a particular work of Gwendolyn Brooks's that resonates with you, that is inspirational? I don't want to say favorite. Oh, I don't have a favorite. You know, <laughs> you know at, depending on what day it is and what mood I'm in, I'll say a different, a different poem. Uh, but because we're talking about Lorraine Hansberry and Gwendolyn Brooks, I'm thinking of kitchenette buildings because that whole business of living in the kitchenette is so important to a raisin in the sun and important to Miss Brooks. I have to take off my glasses to see. <laughs> kitchenette building. We are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grayed in and gray. Dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. But could a dream send up through onion fumes its white and violet fight with fried potatoes and yesterday's garbage ripening in the hall, flutter or sing an aria down these rooms, even if we were willing to let it in, 
had time to warm it, keep it very clean, anticipate a message, let it begin. We wonder, but not well, not for a minute, since number five is out of the bathroom now. We think of lukewarm water, hope to get in it. Imani, mm -hmm. your latest book, mm -hmm. Breathe, mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to say that this is such a lyrical and a magnificently tender uh, work. And, and you're known for, uh, for your scholarly writings, accessible mm -hmm. scholarly mm -hmm. writings, you know, not with, uh, you know, all these big words that you got to go run into <laughs> the dictionary. But... Uh, br uh, it's breathe yes. is a departure from that. Yes. And I'm just wondering what the, it, it's breathe, uh, letters to my son. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I was thinking, of, of course, the comparisons to ta Coates' mm -hmm. Between the World and Me, mm -hmm. which was a letter to, or, or an epistolary narrative yes. to his son. It, it, the comparisons are, are probably, mm -hmm. have been done. Yes. But I'm just wondering, uh, I, I've been thinking about the figure of the ancestor represented in, in, in um, African American literature, but the ancestor as the writer. Mm -hmm. Oh, with, yes. You know, with these intergenerational kinds of messages and wisdom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a significant departure. But, you know, I think um, for me, I mean, one is that there's always been sort of a frustrated creative writer in me, and I've always tried to bend that, the, the scholarly form to suit that, but I got to the point where I wanted actually to think a great deal about form, um, and that what form does, what literary form does, um, when, you, when you really commit to craft is that you can excite the imagination and the intellect as well as the emotional. Respond. You can create a kind of potential for resonance, um, and I think. I mean, I think you know, Gwendolyn Brooks is is a sort of extraordinary example of that because the the formal aspects of the work are just so unbelievable, and yet there's right that people laugh and you feel right as she. I mean, I think that, so. So for me, that um, the transition is about sort of. Uh, my own creative aspirations, but also standing in a tradition um, that, and the invocation is also made to Baldwin's letter to his nephew. Um, but it, for me, it's also um, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which in some ways is a kind of narrative form of a, of a letter from an aunt to a nephew, right, where she's actually trying to teach him that what he values um, with accumulation is not as important as his tradition, his history, right? So I'm trying to invoke that, or Morrison's A Mercy, where there is a mother, a, a miscommunication between a mother and a daughter that becomes a source of heartbreak, sort of trying to think about how to repair the potential for miscommunication when you're trying to protect a child, right? Which is what she's doing in that, what that novel's about. And so, um, so it, yeah, so I'm trying to step into the tradition of these women that we're talking about in various ways, right? To try to figure out a way to draw upon the writer as an ancestor because we have this unbelievable body of work that helps us figure out how to navigate um, horrifying circumstance with incredible grace and beauty and we need that tradition now perhaps more than ever. I would agree. We could be here for hours talking to these amazing women about these amazing women. Um, thank you, Imani Perry. Thank you so much, Angela Jackson, for giving your works to the world and also for honoring the literary godmothers <laughs> who've inspired us all. So we're going to clear the stage and move on to the next part of the program.
act one. Lorraine Hansberry at her desk furiously types away on an old manual typewriter. A sign on the wall above her desk reads, Chitterling Heights Revisited. She is surrounded by stacks of paper, books, cigarettes, an ashtray, and a glass of scotch from which she occasionally drinks. Posters of Raising the Sun, the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window, with yellow clothes banner across it, and African artifacts line the walls of bookcases. The doorbell ring, rings. Lorraine glances toward the door, ignores it, and continues to work. With no response, a hard knock follows. Yes? What is it? Hello? May I come in? The door's open. Lorraine doesn't leave her desk. The door opens slowly. Filtering light and mist follow Gwendolyn as she enters the room. A train whistle blows and fades. Gwendolyn Brooks enters wearing an iconic head wrap and wristwatch, suitcase in hand. She looks around, confused. Gwendolyn under her breath. Chitlin Heights revisited. Where in the world am I? Look, <laughs> Lorraine without looking up. You're in my world at Croton on Hudson. I always did my best writing there at least until 6 p.m. September 12th, 1965. Gwendolyn focusing on her ambivalent host. Lorraine Hansberry? Lorraine rises from her seat to get a better look. Do I know you? Gwendolyn Brooks? Yes, the last time I checked. Yes, yes, you look different than I remember. You'd look different, too, if you were 83 years old. 83? What year is this? Well, I died on December 3rd, 2000. The year 2000? So much must have happened since I left in 65. Did we get there? Where Malcolm and Martin were trying to take us? Did we? What about Africa? Is she independent now? And, and what about my work? Did I help to make a difference? Do they even remember me? Those are a lot of big questions. I don't know if I have enough time to answer them. Besides, I've got to get to my Henry. Have you seen him? My husband, Henry Blakely. No, I haven't. But... You must be thirsty after your journey. I was about to have a cup of tea. Will you join me? I guess so, but I need to be going soon. Gwendolyn pauses to look around. Exactly what is this place? It's a kind of way station. Oh, then my husband must have passed through here. No, not here. Not even my husband, Robert Nemiroff. I used to call him Bobby. What about our friend James Baldwin? My Jimmy, I adored him. We fought, drank, and smoked together. We loved each other like brother and sister. He hasn't been here either. Nobody but you. Gwendolyn says to herself. Henry hasn't been here. I wonder where he is. Gwendolyn to Lorraine, she says. I think I'll have to beg your pardon and pass on the tea. I need to get going. Of course. Do you have your traveling papers? Traveling papers? What are those and why do I need them? This is not your final destination. You'll need your papers to move on. Uh, they must be around here somewhere. Tea kettle whistles. Why don't we have some tea and then I'll take a look. Gwendolyn sits down to wait. You seemed so busy when I came in. Working on something important? There's this play I was struggling to complete before I left. Lorraine regards Gwen slyly. Can I tell you about it? As long as it doesn't take too long. So, you'll stay for a minute. How do you take your tea? Lorraine holds up each item as she calls it off. Sugar? Two, please. Lemon or cream? Lemon, just a slice. Raisins? Come again? Just checking to see if you were paying attention. My sense of humor has grown warped here in limbo. But raisins? I don't get it. Lorraine brings a tea tray to the coffee table. It holds two teacups, a 
a teapot, a bowl of lemon slices, a plate of cookies, a flask of scotch, and a box of raisins. She pours out tea, drops two sugar cubes and a lemon slice into a cup, and hands it to Gwen. She pours out her own cup, adds a liberal dose of scotch, then upends the flask and takes a long swallow. Bottoms up. Gwendolyn touches her teacup to Lorraine's and a toast. Just this one cup now, then I'm on my way. Oh, wait a minute. Raisins? A raisin in the sun. The family younger in that cramped apartment and their dreams of a better life in a better neighborhood. I love that play. Thank you. I adored the attention, the awards and accolades it received, but I wanted to do so much more. Are you kidding? You were the first black playwright on Broadway. When I wrote that play, I wrote it with my soul. It's just a bit disconcerting when one work comes to define your entire existence. Joan, I know it. Three words for you, Lorraine. We, real, <laughs> cool. Oh, that poem, the stark portrait of urban life, the deceptively simple language, that's the stuff that Pulitzer Prizes are made of. I know people like the poem, but as with you, I have written other things. Exactly. For me, A Raisin in the Sun was a hard act to follow. When I came out with the sign in Sidney Brewstein's window, a political drama with white leftists and artists in Greenwich Village, nobody knew what to make of it. Everybody wanted to know why I was writing about white people. Let me guess. They wanted a retread of Raisin, a black play with black actors. And if you try to live up to other people's expectations, Lorraine, you go crazy. Is that what haunts you? Gwendolyn looking around the space with hands upraised. Don't you have some place to be? I know I do. As the grandfather clock strikes six, Lorraine rises abruptly and crosses to where an African spear is mounted. Lorraine takes the spear in hand, prances and parries, pretending to fight an invisible foe. Gwendolyn leans back as Lorraine spins by. Who or what are you trying to slay? The dragon of disappointment, the goliath of despair, the colossus of unmet promises. The windmill of futility. Lorraine stops to fix Gwen with a reproving, with a reproving stare. Actually, I'm not quite sure. I just know I left the other world without ever finishing what I had hoped would be my magnus opus, my unfinished play, Les Blancs. Gwendolyn, are, thoughtfully. Are you certain it wasn't finished? Of course it wasn't. I died. The idea came to me after seeing Jean Genet's play, The Blacks, which I was not a fan of. It trivialized the struggle of colonized people, blacks, and women. Critics lambasted me for writing about white people, but it's okay for a white man to write about the black experience. With Le Blanc, I was talking about African liberation. Lorraine holding aloft the spear. Imagine this. The play opens in the clearing of the bush, the fiction, fictional nation of Zetembe. A gorgeous woman appears, Dark and imposing. And her name? Lorraine begins to dance. As in the prologue, prologue to Le Blanc, African sound effects are heard along with mounting drum beat and shifting lights. She has no name. She is Africa's yearning for freedom. Woman warrior personified, she dances. Lorraine taking the spear and plunging it into the earth of a plotted plant. She shouts, Uhuru! Why is this sounding so familiar? Okay, there's Mother Africa, and then what? Then you have some white missionaries, colonial functionaries, two African brothers, an armed freedom struggle. I, I still have a few snags to work out. It was my chance to finish what I started with Raisin in the Sun. A sequel? No, a conceptual extension. 
Like I said before, I died before I finished, I died. Was it Paul Valeri or W.H. Auden who said, a work is never truly completed, merely abandoned? I will never abandon Le Blanc, never. The clock strikes six for the second time. Gwendolyn finishes her tea and glances at her wrist, her wrist watch, frowning. You were ahead of your time, Lorraine, the first black playwright to take on the African freedom struggle. African redemption waits for no man or woman, not even death itself. The motherland finally freed herself from the yoke of colonial rule. Africa is free? <sighs> Africa still has a ways to go, but so do we. We're still fighting for certain freedoms and equity in America. Lorraine interrupts her, irrationally confrontational. That could be, but back then, no one cared about Africa, nobody. It was all Tarzan and Jane, elephants and lions, colonized, exotic and foreign. Have you written on the subject? Anti-colonial struggle? Yes, <laughs> but black Chicago was always my métier especially in my earlier writings, some of us carry our torches out into the world. Some of us keep the home fires burning. And what about your politics, dear? Were you active in civil rights, the Communist Party, the Black Power Movement? I was never much of a joiner. I was a supporter of causes like, you know, J Jimmy Baldwin, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, and many of us born before World War II. I was part of the indignant generation. In our work, in our own way, we all address the injustices of the privileged world, the lynchings, the stolen rights, the threat of censorship, and the constant shadow of Jim Crow. What about struggle, organizing, action? Indignation seems poor inspiration for political change. Do I detect a tinge of judgment, Lorraine? <laughs> Indignation is the match that starts the fire. Le Blanc was supposed to be that match, and it was never finished. That's what has me so rattled. No judgment intended. I was just wondering about your political leanings. Unlike you, Lorraine, I don't hail from a long line of activists. My people were solid, charitable, working class. From the time I was small, I can remember all manner of struggling people sitting down to eat at the Brooks family table. That was our brand of revolutionary activism. Now me, I cut my teeth on political action. My mother and father, my uncle, my grandfather, they were all race men and women. It's in my genes. It wasn't until I came under the tutelage of Paul Robeson and W.B. Du Bois that I began writing seriously. I was 50 years old when I came into political consciousness. The Black Writers Conference at Fisk University in 1967, where all the young black radicals were gathered. I came in a Negro and left there a black. One single event changed your life? Everything. My life, my writing, my outlook, my hair. That's when I started wearing it natural, you know. Lorraine self-consciously fingers her own straightened hair. I might have gone natural, too, if I had lived. I was moving to the winds of change, and it felt good. Oh, the glorious 1960s, the Chicago campaign, the Vietnam War protests. Hell no, we won't go. Muhammad Ali refusing the draft. No Viet Cong ever called me a nigger. Lorraine in a perplexed stage whisper? Huh? No Viet Cong ever called me. Gwen continues, oblivious to Lorraine's confusion. The, S the Selma to Montgomery march, deacons for defense, the Black Panther Party, and who could forget James Brown's famous call to the culture? Say it loud! We're black and proud. Oh, the glorious 1960s. 
Yeah, the glorious 1960s. I wouldn't live out the decade. So many deeds undone. So many works unwritten. I've got to finish this play, Gwendolyn. People need to know that Africans are willing to fight, to even die for their freedom. Look, Lorraine, there's something you need to know before I leave here. Your play, Les Blancs? The grandfather's clock strikes six again. Gwendolyn looks at the clock curiously, anxiously. Lorraine goes across the room and begins frantically looking under the bed. She pulls out a suitcase. What's wrong with that clock? It's always six o'clock in Chitterling Heights. Do you think my traveling papers are in there? I really do need to get going. Possibly. We'll have to see. I still don't understand what your rush is, though. Muttering under her breath. It's not like you have to worry about dying anytime soon. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Look what I found. Smiling proudly, Lorraine holds up two oversized black dolls. One doll has a dark complexion and is dressed like a traditional 1950 homemaker and mother wearing an apron, shirt-waisted dress. She hands this doll to Gwendolyn. Lorraine picks up another doll who is lighter in complexion and dressed in a suit with a small leather portfolio tucked under her arm. Lorraine rises from the floor and sits on the side of the bed. She pats the bed, encouraging Gwendolyn to come sit next to her. Gwendolyn reluctantly sits, clutching the doll in her hands. Lorraine starts braiding her doll's hair. Gwendolyn stares at the doll in her hands. This is my passport to the next life. My papers are a doll? Of course not. Don't be ridiculous. This is just something to occupy us while I try to figure out where they are. I don't think I'm the one being ridiculous here. Gwendolyn gives Lorraine the side eye. <laughs> Lorraine looks over at Gwendolyn. Did you play with dolls a lot when you were a little girl? I spent most of my childhood daydreaming about mountains, clouds, and great open skies. Then I turned those imaginings into poems. Gwendolyn shakes her head. What about you? I had beautiful dolls, but I was learning how to represent the race while also fighting the black kids I had more than and fighting the white kids who didn't want me to have what they had. Sometimes I felt like I couldn't win. Sounds like you were in a double bind. Life wasn't always that easy for me, either. I was rather quiet, you know, bookish, and kept to myself. But I was a target anyway because I was dark. And I didn't have good, good hair. hair. Hmm. They didn't hurl rocks or fists, but their words always hit the mark. To the other black children at school, I was that old black gal. And to the whites, I was invisible. They completely ignored me. There is as much pain in ugly words and silence as in fists. Did your parents know how they treated you? They just poured more into me, more love, more pride, more dreams. In my house, I felt special. It was the armor I wore every time I stepped out into the world. Their ugly words didn't do as much damage as they could have, but I still was lonely most times. Did it get any better in high school? <laughs> the ironic thing was the black boys didn't want me, but they threatened this white boy who had planned to ask me out on a date. Once you were an adult, did you ever date a white man? No, I love black men. No offense. <laughs> None taken. I didn't start out on the other side. I dated black men before I met Bobby. We had so much in common. Our politics, our activism, and our commitment to the struggle, the arts, and our bohemian lifestyle in the village. I'm sure he did. What do you mean by that? You were perceived to be the perfect black woman. You passed the paper bag test, not too dark and fine features, acceptable in both white and black worlds. 
Are you questioning my blackness? Never. Your life and your work attest to your blackness and your commitment to the struggle. I'm just saying, visually, you were more acceptable. The difference between Diane Carroll and Nina Simone. First of all, Nina Simone was beautiful. She was also my friend. Second, my mother taught me early on that the world would never let me forget I was black and female. Like we could ever forget. Being black and female was one of the greatest gifts the universe ever gave me. You know, black women have so many struggles. If it's not our looks, it's our abilities. Do you know when Raisin premiered, one white male critic had the nerve to suggest that it wasn't serious because it was about ordinary black people? I suppose they expected you to write a nice, folksy, domestic Negro play, or maybe a silly comedy. Instead, you gave America a black play with real-life black people at the center with all our complexities. Not nice, Lorraine. Gwendolyn shakes her finger at Lorraine. They never said that to Richard Wright about Native Son. They didn't question him, called him brilliant. But so was I. <laughs> They'll make room for a black man's anger because they're, they're afraid of it. But women, especially black women, we're supposed to be emotional. We can even cry, but we can't get angry. They define our place and tell us to stay in it. We know that's pre preposterous because black women were born with attitude and atmosphere. Being black and female is indeed paradoxical. It's a gift because it makes us twice as strong. Gwendolyn nods in agreement. Because of our gender and our race, while our men may get to be the generals, we black women are the foot soldiers. Yes, my father was a general. He worked hard to provide a life of affluence, something beyond the reach of the average black family back then. He fought like hell to make sure we had the right to live anywhere his money could afford, all the way to the Supreme Court. Yes, I remember. That lawsuit opened doors for other blacks seeking decent housing. But while he was in Washington, D.C., fighting for the right to live in a white neighborhood, it was my mother who sat up all night, sleeping in a chair with a loaded pistol, protecting her children from the angry white people who didn't want us there. She was the one who had to face their violent rage every day. Watching her taught me how to fight back. General, my father David was more of a gentleman. He was... Wonderful. He provided for us, read us stories, sang to us, was kind and loving. My father encouraged my creativity, but it was my mother, Keziah, who fought for my dream to be a writer. She nurtured that seed in me from the time I was seven years old. Mama always told me, Gwen, one day you're going to be the Lady Paul Lawrence Dunbar. You became that and more. I wasn't like you. I didn't always know what I wanted for my life. At one time, I even thought I'd be a doctor. Really? Just like Benita in A Raisin in the Sun? She's the one who was most like me, flitting from one thing to another, one man to another. I flitted from art to activism, delved into communism, and explored journalism. That's how I finally found my way to writing creatively. Writing gave me somewhere to put all those painful, violent images I saw happening to black people all around me. My mama had her gun. I had my pen. Gwendolyn lays her doll down on the bed. I miss my mother and my father. We've been separated from each other for so long. I miss my Henry most. Gwendolyn <clears throat> clears her throat, stands up, and speaks slowly and sternly. That's why I'd appreciate it if we can get back to the business at hand. All of this has been nice, but I need to find my traveling papers. What's your hurry? 
I don't know why you're still here, but I need to move on. I want to find my people and whatever else is next for me. Do you understand? I'd like to see Henry again. There are things I didn't get a chance to say before he left. Lorraine takes both dolls back over to the suitcase and gingerly puts them away. Her hand touches something else, and she lifts it out. It is a wedding veil. She walks over and places it on Gwen's head and drapes the veil around her shoulders. Gwen is taken aback. Were you happily married? I must have been. I was married for 57 years until the day Henry died. Hmm. <laughs> I met Henry when I was 21 years old at the YWCA on 46th Street, where the NAACP Youth Council met. He was my first real love. The moment I laid eyes on him, he was so dignified and handsome, I knew I was going to marry him. Sounds romantic. But did he feel the same way? The, that night, he was looking for the girl who wrote, because he was a boy who wrote, I fit the bill. Even though you were light-skinned and didn't have long, wavy hair. From the time I was a little girl, when I dreamed of marriage, I knew I wanted someone who would adore me. Does that sound narcissistic? But that was what I got from my family who adored me, and it was what I wanted from a husband. Of course, our marriage wasn't perfect. We took a few sabbaticals. What was the problem? What I understand now that I didn't know then is that giants cast long shadows. Henry lived in my shadow. That's why I want to see him. So, what did you mean by sabbaticals? There are times when separation is the best thing if the marriage is to survive. Gwen takes the veil off and puts it on the rain. What about your marriage? That depends on how you're defining marriage. Lorraine laughs starts to fling and flounce the veil from side to side with her hand. If by marriage you mean <coughs> when two people make a public pledge or commitment to live together, then Bobby and I had a good marriage. But that's not what I asked you. I asked, were you happily married? Were you in love? Lorraine takes the veil off, folds it over her arm. He understood me in ways that no one else did. Lorraine looks up. Gwen. Bobby adored me. I loved him and I needed him. Bobby was my confidant and friend. He inspired my creativity, was the one who kept me on track when I was distracted, even though he thought I was undisciplined. He made the money that made it possible for me to write. Without Bobby and his backing, we might not have had a raisin in the sun. I see what he gave you. But marriage is a two-way street. What did he get out of it? All Bobby wanted was me. He never made any demands. But having someone who adores you can get to be too much after a while. Sometimes it can be suffocating. Lorraine lays the veil down on the bed and sits down. I was looking for the earth to move, and it never did. <laughs> I guess we both always knew that ours had been more of a platonic friendship. How long were you married? Officially for 11 years, but we were separated for seven of those years. We maintained the illusion that we were married. Why didn't you divorce sooner? Why the pretense? I wanted another life, but there was no place for him in that life. What do you mean, another life? Lorraine stares at Gwen, but does not speak, only shakes her head. Gwendolyn continues to press her. Hmm, a platonic friendship? <clears throat> the earth didn't move? Another life? What are you saying, Lorraine? Lorraine becomes quiet. 
She rises from the bed and saunters over to a window in the living room. She peers through the window. Behind the window, a rustic scene of an old Spanish church looms amidst huts made of clay and mud and Spanish colon colonial homes. She, makes, she takes a hanky from her breast pocket and presses it to her neck. Suddenly melancholy, she dabs at her eyes. Gwen follows Lorraine to the living room and sits down on the couch. She turns slightly to address Lorraine. Lorraine? Lorraine? Did you hear me? Lorraine shakes her head, looks over her shoulder. Yes, I heard you. I've loved many things about my life. The clock strikes six again. Lorraine and Gwendolyn both ignore it. Yes, go on. Lorraine turns fully away from the window to face Gwen. Being a married woman, maybe not so much. I did love a woman so completely that when I talked about romantic love, many believed I was talking about Bobby, not her. Gwendolyn, pensive, looks up toward the ceiling as though thinking. A slender hand and long finger return to her cheek. Before I died, things were changing. Being gay didn't carry as much of a stigma that it had when you were alive. In the black community? Mm, even in the black community. So, when did you know? I think I always knew, even in college. I just never acted on it until I visited this quaint artist colony in Mexico. Even then, it was just an idea released from this tight kernel of middle-class morality. I didn't quite follow the way of the sporting woman that I wrote about in my love poems published in the Chicago Defender, but I wasn't a nun either. Hmm. I'd come to resent the hoops that I jumped through to prove myself as a respectable Negro woman under my mother's direction. Is that when you moved to New York, when you became overcome by everyone else's expectations? Lorraine nods her approval. Exactly. I admit struggling to stay in that academic girdle, but I flourished once I was able to extricate myself from the confines of their ivied walls. I see. Lorraine douses her tea with scotch. In college and Chicago, grief that I couldn't name and hadn't been able to shake suffocated me. I always wondered why you didn't return to Chicago. Lorraine looks toward the window. Some grief stays with you forever. In Mexico, I found a freedom and acceptance without a forward. There was no explaining, no meetings to discern my acceptance, no twirling me around to measure my blackness or acceptability, no having to pretend a peck on the lips. Lorraine pauses to raise two fingers to her lips. Was platonic and nothing else. It was the first place where I felt completely embraced for who I was. I understand. That must have been difficult for you. Were you ever attracted to women? I've admired the beauty of black women, even yours. Some I've even looked at twice, but physical or sexual attraction, no. Lorraine clutches at the bodice of her shirt. Why, Gwen, you think I'm beautiful? You don't even. <laughs> Lorraine and Gwen, the two women both laugh. Seriously, were you not attracted or wouldn't you allow yourself to explore the possibilities? I didn't need to consider the possibilities because the earth shook with Henry. He was that type of ecstasy for me. He and my children were all I needed. Hmm. Bobby tried, but let's just say, in that sense, together we weren't poetic. Hmm. Who did you find that poetic love with? Lorraine pulls a shawl off the couch, shawl off the couch, and wraps herself in it. Dorothy. When I left the other world to come to this one, her blue eyes 
were the last things I saw. Lorraine looks into her hands. The warmth of her hands holding mine were the last thing that I felt. Blue eyes? Well, then she must have had blonde hair, too. She did. Were any of your female lovers ever black? I found more acceptance among white lesbians. Hmm. Did being lesbian add another layer of oppression for you? Sure it did. As I was emerging as my true self, sans Bobby, I wrote a number of letters to the latter, a West Coast lesbian magazine at the time. My first communications were hostile to the cause. I even referred to the readership as you people. <laughs> I had not come to accept my own sexuality. Sexuality will always be complicated. I raged against lesbians who were married to men and urban dykes who were more comfortable in bow ties and tailored men's suits than dresses. But the latter's readership was quick to expose my own hypocrisy. I was still living a protected life with Bobby, even if we were separated. But at least you wrote the truth. Only half the truth. I signed each letter using my initials, L-H-N. It was not until I was close to departing the last world that I accepted my homosexuality, which I committed to, if only for a short while. As my life waned, my resolve to live my life the way I desired became stronger, and I was okay with loving any woman of accomplishment, no matter her look. No one knew? Bobby knew. Jimmy knew. Nina knew. Otherwise, I was discreet. Gwendolyn wags her head in disbelief. What? I don't know about every woman's marriage, just my own. So forgive my ignorance on the matter of a lesbian in a heterosexual marriage. Go on. Is that why you left him and moved to Chitlin Heights? <laughs> Chitlin Heights, this place. Lorraine opens her arms as though presenting, then looks at the clock on the wall above her desk. No, the other place, the one in the other world. Lorraine covers her face with her hands before allowing them to drop to her lap. Technically, Bobby left first. Just the same, Chitterling Heights is where all my identities came together. My place out in the country was one of comfort and continuity because I could achieve all those things, except borrow more time to write more plays or even finish the one I was working on. Les Blancs. Yes, Les Blancs. I just wish I could have done more. I think as women, we always want to be more, do more, give more. I was able to achieve a lot as an author and a poet. I even had ample opportunity to move from what some of my peers saw as white writing because of the classical forms and styles to works that emulated the rhythmic black voice. Why do we even have to qualify our writing as black or white? It's as if being human is not qualification enough to write about any experience. Because our stories were not being told with the dignity and honesty that they deserved. Lorraine gets back up to dance around and hum. If I had finished it, Les Blancs would have exposed the plights of colonialism. Lorraine slows her dance a drag. Then the ideas began to slow to a crawl, and life began to drip from my veins. Suddenly, I was no more. My chances to make a difference, as you have done, were over. It was finished by others. Even so, to be the one who begins something is just as important as the one who finishes it. Gwendolyn stands up, pulls Lorraine from the couch with her. Gwendolyn opens her suitcase and pulls out a book entitled Les Blancs. That's mine? Gwendolyn hands Lorraine the book. Lorraine leafs through the pages. It is. Les Blancs like all of your other plays, are actively 
being staged all over the world. And why? Because they expose truths we need to hear. You see, with the 34 years you had on earth, you accomplished a great deal from raising in the sun to Le Blanc. You made a difference. Is that what you wanted to tell Henry? What? Henry, did you want to tell the poet of 63rd Street that he made a difference? Yes, and that I appreciated all of his sacrifices. Lorraine scoots to the edge of her seat. And? And none of your business, Miss Hansberry. <coughs> <coughs> now, where are those darn traveling papers? Your books, your poems, your words are your traveling papers. Lorraine, if we hadn't already passed on and I were a violent woman, I'd strangle you. <laughs> but maybe I needed to stop here for your sake. Lorraine clutches the neckline of her shirt. My sake? Yes. Your sake, because now that you know the impact of Le Blanc and your other plays, you can move on, too. I guess I can. The, grand the grandfather clock strikes seven. <laughs> they both look at the clock and nod. Lorraine and Gwen each grab their suitcases, lock arms, and head for the back door. End of play. Or if you'd like to start this up on stage. Okay. Right. Height adjustment. Hello, my name is Tina Jenkins Bell and I am one third of the Indignant Women Collective. I hope you all have enjoyed this event tonight because we all have really enjoyed you and being a part of this experience. That leads me to the event's final activity, which is the Q&A. But first, a few ground rules. Uh, one, we, add, we have about 15 minutes for the Q&A, so we ask that if you have a question, you stand, state your name, and identify the panelists uh, to whom you're directing your one question. In addition to, I said one again, didn't I? <laughs> In addition to asking questions of Ms. Perry, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Apoku, and Ms. Lively, um, Sandra and uh, Janice will be on hand to answer questions about the play, and Ms. Jackson and Ms. Perry will answer questions about the books, um, their books, and other questions that you may have. Um, if you need to clarify your question with a statement prior to the inquiry, please be brief. Okay, so since we're all in agreement, right? Okay, we can move on. Okay, questions? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I guess I'll start with you, Ms. Jackson. Well, I forget, there are two Ms. Jacksons. I didn't say Jackson Apoku, though. Okay. Angela, I guess I'll start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, which of Mrs. Brooks' works, or Miss Brooks' works, um, uh, seemed biographical or told her personal story? Which one do you think? Is autobiographical? Yeah, yes. Oh, she herself said that um, several of the chapters of Maud Martha are autobiographical. Uh, the self-solace, where uh, there is an incident in a beauty shop, mm -hmm. and a racist white woman makes a comment, mm -hmm. and the owner, the owner of the shop responds with a denial about the use of the word 
that begins with N. <laughs> and um, another uh, one that I can think of is the visit of the black child to a Santa. Mm -hmm. Ms. Brooks said that her son was uh, uh, not greeted as warmly by the white Santa Claus in the department store. He was very attentive to the white children, but seemed bored when her son was talking, and she recreated that as a chapter in Maud Martha. And also, she said that um, the chapter on the birth of the child in Maud Martha was uh, Henry. Henry was, was uh, <laughs> Henry, when, when, um, no, when Henry, okay. during the birth, Henry, her husband, was acting all uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> emotional and spastic, mm -hmm. and that was recreated in that scene, and that is one of my favorite chapters because it, <laughs> it's so funny mm -hmm. and real, real life, and uh, those are the, the, the ones that I can think of immediately. Um, I can't, oh, the poem to my sisters who have kept their naturals. Mm -hmm. She, yeah, that's Sandra, Sandra says, that's her favorite poem. <laughs> <laughs> and also um, uh, poems that she wrote to specific people like Haki Matabudi mm -hmm. and Carol Petsy Kotsitsili. Uh, those are ones that I can think of. Also, uh, gay chaps, oh, you know what I'm talking At about. The bar. Mm -hmm. At the bar, yes, um, is dedicated to her brother who was in World War II, and it responds to letters from the front that soldiers wrote her, and she recreated uh, that, those experiences in a, a sonnet. Okay. Uh, those are the ones that immediately come, come to mind. So she used her personal experiences in poetry and fiction as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Ms. Perry, uh, can you talk about, so we, other way, Ms. Perry. Oh, you have it? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so um, we know the importance of, of Raisin in the Sun from a historical perspective, right? Um, how do you think it presents today? How do you think, uh, what impact do you think that it would have, or that it does have today? How does it apply? Yeah, um, well, there have been three film versions mm -hmm. of it. Um, and actually the second is probably the best and the least widely seen. It stars Danny Glover as Walter Lee. It was for American Playhouse, and it's just on VHS. So, you know, have, um, uh, it's hard to, I'm actually not entirely sure how it's received. I mean, it's a, it's very much a period piece. Um, it is, um, most widely produced play by a black playwright period in U.S. history, and it ke keeps having revivals. Um, and so there's something that's, you know, that's kind of universal and human about it in the sense that here are a group of, it's, a, it's an extraordinary mastery of the ensemble form. So everybody has distinct motivations and desires and aspirations, and yet they interact in a family, as a family in a way that is really authentic, and I think it resonates with people. And of course, race persists as one of the most profound issues in our, our country. Um, I think that oftentimes the politics of the play um, are lost on audiences both then and now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and particularly the kind of resistant politics, the critique. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the, the, the black metropolis study that was done in Chicago on part of, as part of the um, Negro in Illinois project, that's a central foundation of it and it really talks about the economic exploitation. So Walter Lee's desire to be like the, the men in the suits, who he's a chauffeur, the difference between that and his father who worked with his hands. I mean, there's a lot of politics and beneath his feminism and then of course uh, her African suitor, Joseph Asagai, who is really Lorraine's voice. Mm -hmm. Even though beneath his personality is like her, her ideas are in, in, in Asagai. Um, so 
it there's still a great deal of potential, but I'm not entirely sure that it's mm -hmm. it's it's received with the depth that it that it has. Okay. You sure can. I, well, I taught uh, Raisin in the Sun uh, in my African American literature uh, course. I taught it at Chicago State University, which is a predominantly black institution, and I also taught it at Columbia College, which is a mixed institution, and I found it to be remarkably current. What a lot of students would say, they, they really understood um, Willie, uh, uh, you know, Walter Lee, uh, mm -hmm. rather, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, sort of, angry and frustrated black man, but they said things like, yeah, he would have been on drugs instead of <laughs> drinking. And yeah, you know, uh, if he had messed up the money like that, you know, I would have, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have been as understanding as mama. So uh, I think that there, there, I think that there is, there, uh, and certainly some of those issues like, you know, substandard housing and thwarted dreams and mm -hmm. that sort of thing are st still with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions yet? There you Okay. Um, and then we'll. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether you have considered or are going to do a, a production of this wonderful performance uh, as a, as a either on Broadway or in some theater, or maybe <laughs> have a Hollywood production of this whole thing so that many millions of more people could be exposed to this wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Um, we're laughing because we barely survived. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> This was, um, when we began this project, we were not aware, at least I wasn't, and Tina has written a play and had it produced, and Sandra has taken playwriting and she was involved in it. This was the first time I, I had endeavored to do something like this. So when we began, I think we, we envisioned three acts, and it, we saw there was gonna be a full play, but the first time we ended up uh, doing a form of it was during the celebration for Gwendolyn Brooks' 100th birthday. And it was performed at the, was it the Rosenwald? Mm -hmm. but, and it was basically dealing with the issue of housing. Lorraine and Gwendolyn Brooks, and Gwen Brooks talking about the housing issue. It has been a lot of work. We would love yes. to see it. And I think if we can get funding uh, to take it on the road to, to develop it more, uh, there is a possibility for that. But right now, uh, we're just excited about today and trying to live <laughs> as today. And, um, and to see what will come next. You want to comment on that, either one of you? Go ahead. Oh, oh no, okay. we, but we were, I was just in terms of with my co writers, right. in terms of um, their thoughts you on. Want to expound? What next. Well, I like the idea about Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears, that's yes. all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. So we have a question right here. Uh, my name is Mary Young. If you can use the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just following up on your question. Could you describe the process by which you wrote the play and what material or poems or plays or works that you may have looked at mm -hmm. to develop it? Or just a little bit more about the development of the, um, of the play itself, because it's a, it's a really interesting and beautiful play. And I was curious about the process. Okay. Um, one of the things that I'd like to comment about, and I know as the moderator I'm not supposed to comment, but I'm going to, okay? Um, so one of the things that I'd like to comment about um, that both um, Ms. Jackson and Ms. Perry mentioned about taking care, you know, with the research and the information that you discovered and how to present that information so that um, it wasn't, you know, um, inflammatory, but that it presented aspects of their lives that most people wouldn't find easily, say in, you know, say if they went on Wikipedia or went online someplace or something like that. So we wanted to present aspects of their lives that would do that and also speak to, you know, people today. Um, that was one of the things that we really took care to do in our process. And for the rest of it, I'll turn it over to you guys. We did a lot of reading. We read, um, 
in my case, all of Gwendolyn Brooks's works, but I had read, uh, as, as an African-American literature teacher, I had read them anyway, um, both Angela Jackson's and Imani Perry's biographies were invaluable, very invaluable. Uh, yes. to us. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, you know, just very respectful but in-depth treatment. I particularly appreciated Angela's exploring the marriage mm -hmm. of uh, Gwendolyn Brooks and Henry Blakely, which was a long marriage and a happy marriage, but also a marriage that did not, was not without its difficulties. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then uh, reading, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry was not as, um, well published as Gwendolyn Brooks was because she didn't live as long. But you know, reading scholarship on her work, reading some of her lesser known works like A Sign in Sidney Brustein's Window and Le Blanc, which was actually finished by Robert Nemiroff, her, yes. her, who was her ex-husband and also he became her literary executor. Mm -hmm. So everything that we could get our, our hands on. And then we also looked at as many videos, like we spent two weeks in Martha's Vineyard, right. and we looked at videos to, I, like, I knew Gwendolyn Brooks, but just remembering her, you know, little uh, uh, mannerisms yes. and the, the turns of phrase, and, you know, Lorraine Hansberry had this kind of very bright, almost brittle uh, uh, personality, so that was also part of our research, you know, mm -hmm. trying to capture the way they spoke and the way that they, that their mannerisms and that sort of thing. I think one of the other important things we wanted to do, uh, and again, we found both of your biographies extremely helpful. Um, they were like our textbooks, and we started with them and with their original, uh, with their own works. But one of the things we were trying to do as we were reading the works um, is to get an impression of what was the thinking behind the works, if that makes sense. So when um, you read about uh, Gwendolyn Brooks' place. We love that play, uh, the, the poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, A Few Forgets, was it, If You Get Sunday? Which one is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, when, you you, forgot, when You Have when Forgotten, you have forgotten Sunday. Sunday. It's yes. a lovely love poem. And it gave us, when, as we were reading it, it was almost like it gave us insights in terms of how she might have felt about Henry. So a lot of it mm -hmm. was interpretive mm -hmm. because you can find out the basic, these are the facts, but in listening to the interviews, to get a sense of these women's personalities and how they thought. And in the works that they wrote, and the essays that they wrote, Gwendolyn Brooks's biographies, the two parts, report from part one, report from part two, from that, we began to, we tried to see how these women thought, what their opinions might have been. We started out with a very long list of things yes. that we were gonna have them talk <laughs> about. And we cut the list down to three areas because we had, what was it, housing and marriage, um, gender and sexuality, um, power, their writing. It was about five or six. And we ended up with just three because there was so much to be explored in that. But um, I must say that uh, Sandra was a hard taskmaster. She gave us our yeah. writing assignments and our reading lists. <laughs> and we had, and but because to be informed about the women, it was very important. And um, as, as Dr. Perry was saying, to make sure that we did justice to them and we did not put words in their mouths that they might not have said or they would not have said or thought. And that was very important. Okay. Um, this will be the last question that we have time for. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lorraine Harrell and I really, really enjoy what you guys did. And what I wanted to know is when you were making the decision to decide which point you wanted to focus on. Did you guys come up with objections about who wanted to do what and how you had to cut some things out? And the passion that you felt when you were working on it and the memories that were brought up when you were working on it. Thank you. Can I answer that one? Yeah, yeah. Let's okay. break another rule. <laughs> I'm going to break another rule. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I'd like to start that one out because I think, so we decided to focus on politics, um, womanhood, and sexuality. And I think the hardest one for us to work on was the sexuality piece 
um, because we wanted to be respectful, but we also wanted to share her truth. And there are, there is research out there, information out there that a lot of people don't know. Um, for example, we discovered that right before um, Lorraine passed away, she was, she was coming to, to grips with who she was as a lesbian, and she was willing to, she, what she wanted to do was to be, to, to express her sexuality more. This is what we discovered. But that's not well known because these are things that she decided, um, like literally like as she was passing away um, or dying. And so um, we had to make the decision of whether or not we wanted to include it. Um, as a journalist, I was like, yes, we want to include it. I don't think it's disrespectful. If that was her truth, we should share it. And so we went back and forth. And I think the beauty of a collaboration is, um, you know, you, you have those discussions. You really, really work it out so that nothing, um, it, it, that, that first thought, that first draft, whatever it is, it's, it's never going to make it to you guys. It was well thought out and we, I mean really, we, I still have welts from Sandra. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we forgive her. Anyway. Somebody's got to be Ike Turner in the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just call uh, me Anna Mae. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to, and, and I know that Imani can, you know, probably speak to this better, is that there was a restricted box. Mm -hmm. um, Lorraine Hansberry's papers were deposited at the uh, Schomburg uh, Library, the uh, Black History Library in New York City, but there was a restricted box that had been censored, what, like 40 years? I mean, almost the entire, almost all of her papers were censored for the, almost yeah. that long. Yeah. Did Nimrod make that, yeah. make that decision? Yeah. Pardon? Did Robert Nimrod make that decision? Um, well, it's, it's, it's complicated. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, um, it, I think what, what is clear is that he wanted, my interpretation, and I think you sort of, you sort of have to ask Joy Gresham, who is now the executor, I think directly, but is that he wanted to wait for those materials to be publicly available until a time in history when it appeared that she, it would not do damage to her reputation, but actually, and the thing is a piece of that is there's an extraordinary amount of writing with lesbian themes mm -hmm. in her archives. So there's novels, there's poetry, there's four published short stories that were published in um, lesbian publications. Um, gay and lesbian publications. So there's a huge body of work um, that I try to talk about in some detail, but which we really are sort of I think, collectively waiting to have out. Um, because one of the things that is clear is that um, she thought about sexuality a lot for many years that she thought about as attached to her feminism, which wasn't common in that period of time. I mean, even people who were out lesbians often didn't necessarily connect it to feminist politics. She talked about it with respect to race, she talked about sort of the, the politics of race um, uh, and the lesbian community in New York and the like. So, um, and then, I mean, just relatedly, and this is not also not well known, but that Nina Simone also had same gender attraction. And mm -hmm. so that was a piece of their friendship. But it was important for us to talk about this because this was a part of her life that she wasn't, for the most part, able to live mm -hmm. uh, and, and to express this you know, very important aspect of her personality because in those days, and I would suggest to some extent, even in these days, it's difficult. And, it, and then, like, I mean, the gay and lesbian clubs are being raided. People are being arrested. Their names are being published in newspapers, so losing their jobs, like the, the level of... Yeah, and that there's actually a story. Well, I, maybe I'll tell that story. But, but um, uh, many years ago, when Skip Gates wanted to write um, an introduction to one of the re-issuings um, of her of her collection, uh, he said, "If I write it, it has to be. I have to mention her sexuality, and the estate would not allow him to do that um, in the '80s, and so he didn't do it. But later, women in ornithology mm. came out." <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you. Um, as we wrap up, on behalf of the Indignant Women Collective, we would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Chicago Humanities Festival, the Poetry Foundation, Morris and Dolores Cole Kaplan Northwestern Day, um, Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities at Northwestern University, and uh, We'd also like to thank uh, Turkey Land Co. Foundation uh, in Martha's Vineyard. They provi provided wonderful uh, place for us to stay for two weeks and work on our uh, play. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Oh, there's a book signing for both Imani and uh, Imani Perry and Angela Jackson outside in the lobby. In the lobby.